Proverbs 19, 8, He that getteth wisdom loveth his own soul. He that keepeth understanding shall find good. Now, this is a very simple uh, equation, really, you could say. Getting wisdom equals care and love and good for your own soul. And it has to do with keeping understanding. The, the meaning, as always in the scripture, is in the words used. What is good? How do you get wisdom? What does it mean to love your own soul? I'll tell you what it doesn't mean. It doesn't mean to love yourself. It sounds like that, doesn't it? Loving yourself is not a virtue. We see that clearly in the Word of God. That's not just my opinion. In this world, it's seen to be a virtue to love yourself. We naturally do that. <clears throat> That's our problem, not our virtue. That's not the message of this verse. The phrase, loveth his own soul, is saying that doing this, the getting of wisdom, is the best thing you can do for yourself. It's not that it isn't real love when I say it's not loving yourself. It's not that this isn't real love. This is real love. It's different, though, from the self-love that is our nature and that's at the root of our sin. Loving yourself in the way that the world does is to be selfish and proud. God-haters, again, not my words, Listen to 2 Timothy 3, 1. It's a mark. Loving yourself is a mark of the reprobate. 2 Timothy 3, 1. This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves. And here's the words. Covetous, selfish, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy. And then the next verse, I didn't put the verse three in my notes, but lovers of themselves rather than lovers of God. To love your own soul, though, in the sense of our text is different. So let's look at the difference. I believe the scripture shows us very plainly. Look at Luke 12 with me, if you would. Luke chapter 12, verse 16. The difference between loving yourself and loving your soul. Well, your, isn't your soul yourself? Yes, but that's the way the wording is in the scriptures, and we'll distinguish it that way. Luke 12, 16, The Lord spake a parable unto them, saying, The ground of a certain rich man brought forth plentifully. And he thought within himself, saying, What shall I do? Because I have no room where to bestow my fruits. <clears throat> he said, This will I do. I will pull down my barns and build greater, and there will I bestow all my fruits and my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, thou hast much goods laid up for many years. Take thine ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said unto him, Thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee. Then whose shall those things be which thou hast provided? So is he that layeth up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. Now, would you say this man loved himself? Pretty clear. But did he love his soul? You see the difference? In the sense of the way the word is used in our text, he hated his soul. He, he damned his own soul. He clearly loved himself, but he neglected the good of his own soul. And in that sense, he despised his eternal soul, consigning himself to hell. A stark example of the difference between the love of soul in our text and the love of self that is evil and self-destructive. If we want to love our soul in the sense of doing 
what is best for us, what we need. The scripture here that we're looking at says we have to get some wisdom. Get wisdom. Now we know from this same book of Proverbs how that happens. The obvious question is how am I going to get that? Where am I going to get that from? By reading a lot of books, by studying things, subjects, facts. Proverbs 2.1, look at it with me if you would. Proverbs 2.1. To get wisdom is to love your own soul. Not with a selfish, proud, God-hating love, but with a genuine desire to be saved, to, to, to save. Didn't, didn't Paul say, save thyself from this? wicked and perverse generation in that sense of course it's God that saves you but he's telling you how that happens and so look at ver uh, verse 1 of Proverbs 2 my son if thou wilt receive my words and hide my commandments with thee so that thou incline thine ear unto wisdom and apply thine heart to understanding well okay so it sounds like if you just try real hard you know You'll get wise. You apply. You incline your ear. You listen and you, well, let's keep reading. Yea, it does involve that. It does involve an earnest hearing of the gospel, the truth. But look, look, look at the rest of it. Yea, verse 3, if thou criest after knowledge and liftest up thy voice for understanding, if thou seekest her as silver, and searcheth for her as for hid treasures. You see, that's, a, that's to search eagerly. That's to search um, with all your heart. What do you value? What is it that's valuable to you? Then shalt thou understand, verse 5, the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God, for the Lord giveth wisdom. It's not in how hard you try or how much you want it. That's just the way that the Lord causes you to latch on to it when you hear it. He gives you that heart. But it's a gift. It's a free gift from God. And when you know that, and when you know who wisdom is, you're going to want it bad. You're going to need it. You're going to count everything else as loss, like Paul did, for the sake of knowing the Lord, that I may know him, Paul said in that passage, that I may know him. What do you mean everything else is done, Paul? That I may know him. You see that here? But the Lord gives it. He gives it. The Lord giveth wisdom. Out of his mouth cometh knowledge and understanding. So it comes from him, and if you're going to get any of it, he's going to have to give it to you. So this reminds us now of a couple of things in the scripture. You remember Abraham when in Genesis 14, um, would you turn over there with me? Genesis 14, 21. Let's look at this together. Sodom was in at war and they lost. And there were many prisoners of war from Sodom that were taken. And uh, the spoils went to Sodom's enemy as well. They took all their goods. And, and when the battle was over, they had lost. But Abraham, they made the mistake of taking Lot with them. Because <laughs> Lot was in Sodom at the time. And Abraham heard about it, and he loved Lot. And so he went after that army and defeated them and won everything back. And the king of Sodom is saying this in that context in verse 21 of Genesis 14, verse 21, the king of Sodom said unto Abraham, give me the persons, give us our citizens back, but take the goods to thyself. You know, you, you won the battle, 
you did all the work. You take the, the gold and whatever spoils there are to thyself. And listen to this now. Listen to what Abraham said, because this is, this is uh, it's not just a, a bright moment. This is, this is a believer's life. This is what it is to know God right here. Look at it. And Abraham said to the king of Sodom, I have lift up mine hand unto the Lord, the most high God, the possessor of heaven and earth. <laughs> he owns everything. <laughs> and I will not take that. I will not take from a, even a thread to even to a shoe latchet that I will not take anything that is thine, lest thou shouldest say, I have made Abraham rich. Abraham wanted this man and everybody else to know who made him rich, who gave him everything he had, who deserved the glory, who really owns everything. God. I've lifted up my hand. What an image that is. What a picture that is. Is that... Again, not just a, a brilliant moment in Abraham's life. This is us. This, by God's grace, it's got to be that way, right? It's got to be that way. Everything the believer gets, he gets from the Lord. You think about that. We may have to make a living in this world, but it's not from this world. We know that. This world has nothing to give. It's like the people talking about government money. The money that the government doesn't have any money. <laughs> it's your money. <laughs> and when we talk about our money, we come and we say, well, I've got a little bit of money. That's the Lord's. He's the possessor of all things, Abraham said. I'm going to hold up my hand to him. And he's, he gives and he takes. And we're fine with that. We're fine with that. And that's true in a physical, earthly sense. And it's true in a spiritual sense. My soul, I hold up my soul to the Lord because he's the possessor of eternal life. He is himself eternal life. And what I need spiritually, if he don't give it, I'm not going to have it. And so I hold up my hand to the Lord. That's a way of life now. There is such a thing as the wisdom of this world, but that's not the wisdom we seek, Paul said in 1 Corinthians 2. We're not interested in that. By God's grace, we're not. Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God, 1 Corinthians 1.24. The word keepeth in our verse, to keep understanding, is to guard it. What would you guard understanding from? When you understand the truth of God, what would you guard that from? There's really only one thing, isn't there? You would guard understanding from error, from falsehood. The opposite or the destruction of understanding is a perversion of the truth, a, per, a, a, a decline in understanding by Something else being introduced. That's why Paul said, I determined to know nothing, no thing among you save Jesus Christ and him crucified. That's why Paul said, I fear lest you be removed from the simplicity, the singleness, the all-inclusiveness that is in Christ. A little leaven, leaveneth the whole lump to guard it to guard it, to keep, to treasure it, to treasure understanding. If you do that, by God's grace, you'll find good. You'll find good. Wisdom and understanding go together and both come from God. I want to look at another passage of scripture or two uh, in the next few minutes here. If you could turn to Job 38, 36. Job 38, 36. We saw in Proverbs where it says, The Lord giveth wisdom. Out of his mouth cometh knowledge and understanding.
Look at Job 38, 36. Who hath put wisdom in the inward parts? Or who hath given understanding to the heart? To keep understanding, to hide it in your heart, to guard and keep and protect it, to treasure it. How does that happen? Where does that come from? Well, the rhetorical question is answered by other rhetorical questions. Who is he talking about here? Who does that? Who can number the clouds in wisdom? You? Or who can stay the bottles of heaven? When the dust groweth into hardness and the clods cleave fast together. The, the, you know, there's a drought and thousands of people die. And the world says, that's not God. God wouldn't do that. Then who did? And where was God when they did it? Verse 39, would thou hunt the prey for the lion? <laughs> you think the Lord just winds up a lion and lets him run like a clock? Every bite of food comes from God. Or fill the appetite of the young lions when they couch in their dens and abide in the covert to lie in wait. Who provideth for the raven his food? You know, the Lord used a raven to provide his prophet with food. Who gives the raven his food? The same God. When his young ones cry unto God, they wander for lack of meat. When the little baby birds are crying out, they're hungry. They're really crying to God, it says. They might expect their mama to bring them a worm or whatever, but they're really crying to God. He's the one that provides it. How beautiful. He's the one that gives understanding to the heart. So let's define a couple other words in this text and we'll be through. What then is wisdom and understanding? Let's define those two. Well, we see where it comes from. We see who gives it and how you get it. It comes out of his mouth. But are you going to get any of it? Well, that's, that's the Lord. That's the Lord. He'll give you, he'll make you hungry for it. Blessed are those that hunger and thirst after righteousness. Not smart, not, you know, prudent, blessed, blessed of God. And he said, if I give you the hunger, I'll give you the food. Isn't that what he said? Blessed are they that hunger and thirst. So they'll be filled. They'll be filled. If God gives you a desire for Christ, and you will lay hold of Christ. You will feed upon Christ. You will nourish your soul upon him. But what's wisdom and understanding? Honestly, think about that for a second. What, is, what separates a wise person from somebody that's not wise? Honestly, in this world, what would the world say? Well, you got to read a lot. You got to read. You got to study a lot to be wise. Is that what it is? <laughs> The Pharisees studied a lot. Was anybody ever called a fool more than a Pharisee by the Lord? <laughs> they studied a lot. They memorized pretty much the whole Old Testament. That's something. To be able to solve riddles, maybe it's just to outsmart other people. Most people consider themselves wise as compared to others. In other words, if I can prove you wrong about some things, that proves that I'm wise. Is that what it is? You're the smartest worm in the, in the heap. <laughs> You're the prettiest maggot on this earth. That's awesome. First John 5, 20. And we know that the Son of God is come and hath given us an understanding. What did he give us when he gave us an understanding? If you can answer that, you can answer our question. What is wisdom and understanding? What does that mean? 
What separates a wise person from a fool? Listen to it. And hath given us an understanding that we may know him. That is true. Him that is truth. And we are in him that is true. Even in his son, Jesus Christ. How'd that happen? Of him are we in Christ Jesus who is made unto us. What's the first thing? Wisdom. Righteousness, sanctification, and redemption. We are in him that is true, even in his son, Jesus Christ. This is the true God and eternal life. When Paul said to Timothy, the scriptures are able to make thee wise unto salvation. That's what he's talking about. God might just use. You preach, Timothy, peradventure. God will give repentance unto the acknowledging of the truth. <clears throat> so if you have that, you'll have good. <laughs> We've got to define another word. Look at it. But wisdom, to know him, that we may know him. Let me say it to you again. If you don't know Christ, you don't know anything. If you know him. You know what Paul said as, uh, in, in contemplating the fact that we know Christ? He said, we know all things. Isn't that the way he said it in 1 Corinthians 2? We know all things. What else is there? <laughs> Doesn't mean we know everything, but knowing him, he's my wisdom. So I have all wisdom. <clears throat> but then, okay, so the end result is good. What's good then? To this world, finding good would be what? To find wealth or fame or whatever. For everything to go their way. You know what it means for everything to go your way? You know what, what that is? You want everything to go your way. You know what that means? To be God. <laughs> the only one that's true of is God. We want to be God, don't we? That's what we wanted in the garden. That's what we want as we sit here today. We want to be God. If somebody crosses us, it incurs our wrath. You don't get to do that. That's God. So what is it to find good? What truly is it according to God? Psalm 4, 6. Let's turn over there. We get, well, we're out of time. If you want to turn there quick, Psalm 4, 6. Here it is. Just as plain as day. Psalm 4, 6. There be many that say, who will show us any good? And here's the psalmist's response to that. Everybody, who's going to show us any good? Just seems like everything's bad. You know, we, we plant our crops and there's a drought or a hailstorm. It looks like the world is working against us, you know. Looks like everything. Who's going to show us any good? Here's David's response to that. Lord, lift thou up the light of thy countenance upon us. You're not going to know any good. You're not going to see any good. You're not going to have any good until the Lord shines upon you. That's what good is. We may call something bad. Something bad happened to me. No, if the Lord is smiling on you, that was good. And something good may happen to us. We say, oh man, this is, wow, it's my day. You know, I'm going to go to Vegas. No, if the Lord's not smiling on you, that was bad. That just took you farther from him. <coughs> good is the Lord looking at you with favor. <coughs> Thou hast put gladness in my heart more than what makes this world happy. You see that? 
more than in the time that their corn and their wine increased. That's just another way of saying more than this world's joy from getting rich. You remember in the story of the rich man that said, what am I going to do with all my stuff? I'm going to have to pull these barns down and build bigger ones. Remember what it said? It said his ground brought forth plentifully. That was wealth then. That's what riches was. That's why he had big barns, but they weren't quite big enough because his ground brought forth plentifully. But what he didn't know is that was the Lord's ground and the Lord's seed and the Lord's sunshine and the Lord's water. For the Lord to smile upon you, that's more, that's joy beyond what makes this world happy. <clears throat> and here's what he said at the end. This is, you know, this is one of my favorite verses. I will both lay me down in peace. How much is that worth? How much corn does that equal? I will both lay me down in peace and sleep for thou, Lord, only makest me dwell in safety. Good, goodness is his light, his countenance, his joy, his peace, safety, security in Christ. That's good. You young people, don't look for it in, in this world. Don't look for it in this world. You're not going to find it. You're not going to find it. And I'm not trying to depress you. I'm not trying to, to say, you know, go live in a convent or something. I'm just telling you, if you're going to find any good, that's where it's going to come from. You must have Christ. And everything else without him is not good. God, give us grace now to seek him as silver, to look for him as for gold. And may God cause us to find. Amen. Let's pray.